Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, Robin invited us to come and talk about uh, technology to design for fast environments. I think it's a kind of playful way to engage with uh, Trent's work. I think we can kind of talk to us about this time and try and think about it. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, but we can try and just um, spin a few ideas to you. It's a nice opportunity for us in particular because it also comes off the back of the uh, uh, SSC grant that we have to uh, look comparatively at infrastructures and places that are imagined or conceived as being off the grid. In Papua New Guinea, where Alice has been working, in India, where I've been working, and in uh, parts of Scotland, in uh, political uh, communities that are established on the uh, basis of the um, dis disconnection from natural borders and infrastructures. So, we'd like to use the opportunity today to, to talk about or think through some ideas about technologies that are being designed for what we think we might be able to call sparse environments. These are technologies that, by conception and by design, imagine contexts in which institutions, systems, technologies, and people are uncoordinated, but which we would argue also produce this context as an effect. Now, specifically, we're interested in technologies that are designed to safeguard or to promote life in places of global poverty. Technologies that, by design, express a humanitarian ethic of care for distant others. These are technologies like a rapid diagnostic test for malaria or an ultra-affordable solar power lantern that are built for places where large-scale infrastructures such as electricity grids or networks of medical facilities and laboratories do not reach and where people's dominant experience is of disconnection from them. These are places like the river plains and hills of Madang in Papua New Guinea, and places like the highlands of uh, South Orissa that are characterized by a low density of data and information, in terms of census data or public health data or market data, but also a low density of connections to state institutions. On the one hand, such places represent a context of chronic crisis or failure, but on the other hand, they also represent a context of opportunity for technological innovations and for a diverse range of humanitarian institutions from international development agencies to corporate philanthropists and social entrepreneurs. So the notion that such places are off the grid, and that they lack the most basic public infrastructure, that humanitarian intervention is necessary in order that people can realise their basic human needs, and that the market is a mechanism for achieving humanitarian ends is now being inscribed in a generation of technological solutions to the problems of development. Technologies like rapid diagnostic tests and ultra-affordable solar lanterns materialise both an ethic of care for distant others and an ethic of commercial interest. So if the notion of technological density describes environments in which humans and non-human actors are coordinated or coupled, then the notion of technological sparsity might be said to describe environments in which these actors are uncoordinated or loosely coupled, and where large-scale technical systems for health and for energy are um, unintegrated, and where their semiotic and material organisation is poorly aligned. So in the development discourse, these kinds of environments are constructed either in terms of the failure of the modern state to provide the basic infrastructure and services necessary to safeguard life, or in terms of the failure of markets to supply goods and services. Humanitarian technologies like rapid diagnostic tests or ultra-affordable renewable um, energy technologies that are designed for these environments share the idea that small-scale, mobile, affordable technologies can substitute for these large-scale public infrastructures. Rapid diagnostic tests which are encapsulated in a small cassette the size of a fist are imagined to substitute for a distributed infrastructure of laboratories, microscopes, and expertise. Meanwhile, solar lanterns that can be powered by sunlight, delivered to consumers by relatives or friends, carrying them along dirt tracks by motorbike, and sold to individual households, substitute for a national grid of power lines and pylons. So technologies that are designed for sparse environments are imagined as technologies that carry their infrastructures with them and that can substitute for these coordinated social technical, um, socio technical systems. In other words, the idea that drives both the interest of governments, of um, 
humanitarian organizations and multinational corporations in these objects is the notion that scaling down to create compact, affordable technologies, kind of infrastructure in a box, can subsequently enable states, NGOs, and corporations to scale up their distribution. In this sense, we might say that technologies designed for sparse environments take technological determinism to new levels. They encapsulate the idea that a small technological unit can render the need for an external infrastructure redundant. And technologies designed for sparse environments are, are being made available and being built to attract new kinds of finance. So ethical or social investment funds, investors in emerging economies, philanthropic capitalists, global philanthropic bodies like the Global Fund um, to fight HIV, malaria and TB, as well as traditional forms of development finance in the form of grants from international development organisations such as DFID. So today we... Oh, sorry, that's... <laughs> so what we want to try and do today is um, present two case studies. One, Anderson's work on rapid diagnostic technologies for malaria in Africa, and some of my work on ultra affordable solar lightings in, in India. In order to try and sketch out an argument that technologies designed for sparse environments also produce or perform those environments as sparse. Now, of course, we recognize that sparse environments are not empty or depopulated. On the contrary, they're crowded with the remnants of past infrastructures, systems, buildings, and forms of expertise that contemporary technologies must articulate with. <clears throat> Um, health policy makers involved in the rollout of rapid diagnostic technologies in Papua New Guinea, for example, or solar entrepreneurs marketing solar lanterns to consumers in rural India, recognize that the environments into which their technologies intervene uh, are, kind of, are, are populated by this kind of array of prior institutions and systems. But our argument is that they don't always imagine or foresee how the technology is designed for sparsity might need to be coordinated or relate to these uh, historic uh, institutions or legacies of uh, past interventions. Instead, what we're arguing that built as standalone replacements or substitutes for, for infrastructures, these kind of technologies reproduce environments of sparsity by reproducing contexts in which institutions, technologies, and actors are loosely coupled, integrated, or coordinated. Um, now this is uh, very much a kind of um, work in progress, and so Alice and I have tried to uh, pull together different elements from our case studies and bring them into a conversation with each other. So I hope you're very Okay, so um, in development discourse, sparse environments are often construed in terms of the failure of the modern state to provide basic infrastructure and services necessary to safeguard the welfare of its citizens. So the idea that Papua New Guinea is off the grid is written into political discourse and representations of that country. Development agency reports about the health system often start with an account of a kind of dilapidated infrastructure and the incredibly difficult terrain for people to traverse. Um, dominant models of, of state failure in these representations really focus on internal implosion due to ethnic conflict, the lack of state capacity, or the absence of political will. So development workers in Papua New Guinea constantly pointed to um, the kind of Stone Age culture or the lack of modern mentality um, as the basis for the failure of their own state building programs. Um, and the development workers really impressed on me the impossibility of their job, as they saw it, of making the health system work, given the fund fundamental inappropriateness of imposing a modern bureaucracy on a primitive society. So, of course, terms such as state failure or market failure do political work, justifying and legitimating new kinds of interventions and actions by the state or by market actors. And by associating sparseness with primitivism, um, these individuals and organisations also broke themselves out of the history of Papua New Guinea's public infrastructure. So, like crisis, failure also creates opportunities, and it makes it possible for particular actors to intervene again and again by writing um, themselves out and by representing past actions and agency in particular kinds of way. And it's really into this environment of a kind of uh, construed failure, health system failure, that OSAID and the Global Fund have tried to insert a rapid diagnostic test for malaria. So as um, resistance to chloroquine-based anti-malarials has reached levels as, so as to make 
um, essentially ineffective in many parts of the world where malaria is endemic. And as the more expensive artemisinin alternatives have placed a really high financial burden on um, ministries of health in developing countries, diagnostic technologies have suddenly kind of exploded onto the scene as a, as a kind of major problem for meeting the Millennium Development Goals in 2015. So in 2010, WHO changed its guidance for treating malaria. Previously, all fever, it had advised that all fevers be treated um, with anti-malarials, with chloroquine. Um, but now they changed it to say that actually you should always diagnose a patient before um, giving them treatment with artemisinin-based um, anti-malarials. And um, this, this uh, change in protocol only became possible because of recent advances since the mid-1990s in the development of rapid diagnostic testing. And I don't really have time to go into the um, um, technology here, but basically it's like a kind of the equivalent of a pregnancy dipstick, that you just have a, a nitrocellulose membrane which um, antibodies are sprayed onto, which capture um, particles from the parasite in the blood sample as it, as it flows across them, and it shows up um, as a kind of line in that window at the top there, that these particles have been captured, um, and that shows you that it's a positive test. So by contrast with microscopy, um, which was the kind of standard for laboratory-based um, diagnosis of malaria prior to the introduction of rapid diagnostic tests, um, rapid diagnostic tests give a, a positive or negative um, result rather than giving an indication of parasitic density. Um, at the end of the 1990s, there were only three rapid diagnostic tests available commercially, but by the mid-2000s, there were 200. Um, in 2004, um, it was estimated that um, the procurement for rapid diagnostic tests was um, 6 million units, and in 2011, it was 155 million. So you can see just kind of what the expansion of this, this um, market has entailed. So against um, the imagined primitive <coughs> sparsity um, of Papua New Guinea, the promise of the rapid diagnostic test lies in the capacity to bypass these kinds of in sparse infrastructural systems and to deliver easily enumerated results. So crucially, unlike microscopy, a rapid diagnostic test doesn't involve microscope, running water, laboratory, a, um, a trained laboratory technician, um, su uh, supplies of reagents, bridges, blood studies or sterile environment. So this whole complex external infrastructure for microscopy is instead replaced with a kit that ostensibly contains this laboratory within the box. Um, so the test is, oh, oh, next slide. Um, the next slide, yeah. So the test um, um, essentially contains um, the cassette itself, a buffer, a capillary tube to collect the blood, an alcohol swab, a blood, a blood lancet, and an instruction manual. This is the kit, and it all comes in a box about kind of this size. Um, and the manual explains that the only external inputs that this test requires is a drop of blood from a fingertip and around one hour's training for the people administering the tests. So in other words, um, the whole idea about these tests is that they render this kind of dysfunctional external laboratory-based infrastructure which can't really work and function is impossible to resource in, in these kind of difficult environments like Papua New Guinea, it renders those redundant because these infrastructural needs have already been built into this compact design. So in 2008, the Global Fund provided um, resources for the scaled up national rollout of about 5 million rapid diagnostic tests in Papua New Guinea. Um, and unfortunately, this rollout, um, which was meant to begin in 2009, was delayed. Um, for several years, and it's never actually been completed. Um, and this is the story that I've been following. And really, it's a story about um, the rapid diagnostic tests from lack of mobility and lack of rapidity um, in Papua New Guinea. And this is really a story at, about um, the kind of need to augment the test, um, the, this rapid diagnostic testing kit, with a whole range of bureaucratic and technological apparatuses for effective regulation, procurement, supply chain control and health worker training. So in other words, rapid diagnostic tests are no less dependent on their integration into an existing public health infrastructure than the microscopy laboratories that they're meant to be replacing. So, um, as I said, by 12, 2012, there are more than 200 malaria rapid diagnostic tests available on the market. 
And this has caused a major problem for regulation. Um, for the first decade of um, the new millennium, huge resources were invested in buying these tests, but um, the only way of regulating, the only um, system for regulating them was actually one man who was sitting in an office in Manila, in an WHO office in Manila. Um, and um, over this period, there were huge numbers of medical publications and trials of rapid diagnostic tests, which were showing that there was huge variation in their efficacy. And this started raising kind of problems. Unfortunately, um, diagn diagnostics don't usually go through in-country regulatory <coughs> systems. They're not like pharmaceuticals. They don't have to be pre-qualified or authorized to be marketed in a country. So this raised the prospect of a need for a kind of global um, system of regulation. And in 2008, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation provided the WHO with $8 million to provide this kind of global regulation. Um, and they now um, have tested 122 products. Um, they provide guidance to governments about how to do lot testing. Um, they publish generic rapid diagnostic test job aids for governments to use in training their health workers. Um, and unfortunately, how they still haven't been able to, to actually kind of set up a system for pre-qualifying rapid diagnostic tests. And they claim that they're still very much behind the market. And they're really struggling to keep up with this changing marketplace. So essentially, the introduction of this new technology has actually necessitated the, the construction of a whole new global architecture for their monitoring, testing, and regulation. In Papua New Guinea, the story gets more complicated. Um, and part of the story is that actually about the procurement bureaucracy in Papua New Guinea, which I don't really have time to go into in detail, other than to mention that RDTs um, aren't just sort of bought by the global fund and then thrown into a country. They actually need to be um, procured through uh, the existing public health system um, bureaucracy. And these are actually systems that have been put in place by OSA and by technical assistance from these development actors. So they're not just sort of sitting there or um, kind of as a kind of indigenous Papua New Guinea institution. These are systems which are actually have been constructed through a whole history of colonial and post-colonial state building in the country. Um, and, um, and there are numerous kind of obstacles and holdups in this procurement process, um, which ushered in a whole new response of health system strengthening and, and kind of good governance in the country. Um, but to move on to the, the kind of one of the main problems of rapid diagnostic tests, which is their supply chain. So the compact size and the weight of the rapid diagnostic test is really considered to be key to its effectiveness, because this is what is making it transportable to remote rural areas. But rapid diagnostic tests in Papua New Guinea still needed to be distributed through the existing public health um, infrastructure. And in this sense, they're very much, um, they're very different from the solar lanterns, which Jamie is going to be talking about, which relies on um, kind of entrepreneurial networks um, of direct distribution to, to sell these um, solar lanterns. Um, by 2010, the process of storage and transportation for rapid diagnostic tests had come to seem highly problematic. So early medical trials of the rapid diagnostic tests were shown that there were huge discrepancies between the laboratory-based and the field-based trials. And it was discovered that one of the reasons for these like, huge discrepancies was that um, many of the rapid diagnostic tests weren't retaining their chemical stability throughout the processes of storage and transportation. Um, and of particular concern here was the control of temperature. So most um, uh, scientific trials showed that most rapid diagnostic tests actually lost their sensitivity above 30 degrees Celsius. Well, in Papua New Guinea, the temperature is regularly reaching 45 degrees. Um, Celsius, um, and this is of particular concern for um, low parasitic densities. And so these scientific studies were recommending that a cool chain be established for the storage and distribution of these tests. And to try and control for these factors, the WHO then started producing these planning and implementation manuals to assist governments in the rollout of these RBTs. And these involve all kinds of specifications about how you should have quality management at every stage, how you should have a cool chain in place, and so on. In other words, for the RDTs to be reliable, they actually needed to be integrated into a, a reliable state-based system for medical distribution. Now, to imagine what um, the enablement of a cool chain for, for rapid diagnostic tests in Papua New Guinea might hold, let me explain how the medical distribution system actually works for many of the rural health centres where um, I've worked. Um, 
that it responds, that really responds. <laughs> so um, in Begasin, a rural health centre, um, about um, five or six hours walk from the nearest road, um, the offset <coughs> child, Joseph, travels, um, a, to, walks to the road, takes a, a minibus into town, which is about three hours, picks up um, a whole pile of boxes um, from the provincial health office, full of the medicines and medical equipment that he needs, and transports them by a public bus back to a kind of drop-off point on the roadside, um, where a small inland um, track starts leading kind of through um, these plains, along rivers and o over some mountains until he reaches this, this health centre about six hours walk away. Um, Joseph can't carry all these boxes, so he, he walks back to the health centre and then kind of over the next few days sends out word as people wander past the health centre, going to the markets or going to their gardens, and says, oh, could you tell some people in the villages please to go and collect these medicines? And if his relationship at that time with the local villagers is good, then you know, hopefully they'll send out some groups of young men or women to go and collect these boxes. Sometimes it can take up to a week or more to actually persuade people who don't really want to do this long trek to the road um, and then carry these big kind of cumbersome boxes all the way back. So it can take up to a week, but at, during which time they're literally just sitting on the side of the road underneath the kind of corrugated canopy which is used for people who are selling betel nut um, and kind of small drinks and things for the passengers passing by. So they're exposed to all kinds of temperatures um, and the elements, and also many of them go missing obviously as people from nearby villages um, take them and try to sell them on themselves. Um, so promotional materials that are making it, this is obviously a situation which is very difficult to imagine that the, the, the kinds of um, planning and um, supply chain tools that the WHO is, is trying to advise governments to set up. So promotional materials make it explicit that the rapid diagnostic test is designed for a place without existing laboratory infrastructure. But what is made less explicit is that it's also designed for a place with an existing cool chain infrastructure. So in this sense, the rapid diagnostic test actually has all kinds of ideas about technological density which are being anticipated in its design. It's articulation with existing health centre dispensaries, village tracks, corrugated iron shelters and uncooled central medical stores is unavoidable. Okay, so the second story I have to tell is about training. So by 2010, the health worker was seen as the weakest link in the process of ensuring the effectiveness of the rapid diagnostic technology. Um, and early descriptions of the RDT had really emphasised the fact that you don't really need any expertise to use these kits. In fact, you know, if anything, you need to just give health workers one hour's training in order for them to use, to use this kit effectively. Um, by 2010, however, following uh, various, the publication of various medical studies, the clinical operation of the rapid diagnostic test was actually considered to be something that the device itself couldn't control for. It didn't actually predetermine the way in which it was going to be used. And the one hour training um, had emerged as a space of unpredictability and uncertainty. It didn't seem to be able to control for the way in which health workers were using this test. So de delivering effective training was something that was absolutely crucial to the global fund rollout of these, these tests in Papua New Guinea. Um, and um, they gave the, the money for providing this training to a small consultancy firm attached to a, a, university, a private university in the Danube province. And this small consultancy firm, which was really just a sort of start-up firm, um, employed an educationalist who had no health systems experience at all from Australia um, to train 5,000 health workers across 20 provinces. And when I met this, this um, man in early 2011, he was in total crisis. Um, he said, out of 20 provincial coordinators, I have three on email. So if they want to provide a project like this, they need to have a reasonable communication system. We have to get hold of them, otherwise how can we bring them together to organise their training? Um, I call their office number, but it's usually disconnected because they haven't been able to pay the bills. Um, now I find basically the only way to get hold of these provincial coordinators is to fax the provincial treasury, because that's where the money goes. Um, we've often ended up cancelling flights, pulling people off the plane because we haven't been able to confirm that their workshop is taking place. And then we have the weather. We send someone over somewhere and then there are storms and the ships aren't able to go and so no one can get there and the workshop doesn't happen. Um, so in order to meet the requirement for a two-month window between training and rollout, so basically they wanted to complete all the training 
two months before these new rapid diagnostic tests and their associated treatment regime would, come, um, would be rolled out. To, and that was partly to prevent the expiry date of these, of these tests and the, and the new treatment that was going to be associated with them um, approaching too quickly. Um, but this meant they had to kind of try and, and train all of these people across this country at the same time. It just created complete logistical chaos. Um, so actually, I'm going to skip that bit. Um, okay, and then the other, there was a second problem with the training program, which was, um, and these problems were really compounded by the tendering process. So a, com a supplier in Papua New Guinea called Borneo Pacific were given the first, were given the tender for the cure of these rapid diagnostic tests. Um, and because they've got this tender, this small consultancy firm doing the training, ordered a thousand of these tests um, and used them for training purposes. And in fact, all of the materials, this, this is a poster that was being produced by this consultancy firm, which is then distributed through all of the health centres and aim posts in Papua New Guinea trying to remind train, um, health workers how to administer the test. And these, um, and these, oh, actually, to that, um, and these images were all based on this particular um, version of the, of the test, which has been produced, um, supplied by this company, Borneo Pacific. Unfortunately, the Global Fund discovered that um, one of the people on the board of directors of Borneo Pacific was also the chief pharmacist in Papua New Guinea and was also sitting on their pharmaceutical control board. Um, and um, in fact, the tender had been written in such a way that the only company that could have been given this, this contract was, in fact, Borneo Pacific. So they immediately cancelled it, put out a new tender, which they said had to be written more broadly, so that any, a, a variety of different suppliers giving very different kinds of rapid diagnostic tests can only be complete. And the company that won it um, actually produced a slightly different cassette. It was a type C rather than a type D cassette. Now, in a type D cassette, the um, there are three lines the first, that would appear um, to give them in a results window. The first line shows that the patient had falciparum in malaria. The second line would show they had non falciparum in malaria, and the third line was the control. Well, in the new type C tests, the first line showed they had non falciparum in malaria, the second line showed they had falciparum in malaria, and the third line was the control. So they were completely back to the front, and 5,000 health workers had to be trained in how to read. Um, these rapid diagnostic tests, which were meant to, you know, immensely improve the safety of malaria treatment regimes. So obviously this was completely impossible. And the Global Fund then had to cancel the, the, the contract for the Type C test and re-establish a contract with the Corneo Pacific for the Type D test. And this entire process took over a year. So there was a, a long de delay. Um, and this um, raised prospects that the, both the tests and the treatment when they arrived would be out of date. Or well, certainly by the time they got to the um, got to the health centres, um, but also that the health workers who've been trained in the use of these tests might actually have forgotten some of their knowledge. Okay, so just uh, there are just two two elements of this process, um, which was actually kind of very very long and, and kind of quite complicated. Um, but just to, to conclude, really, rapid diagnostic tests clearly don't substitute for infrastructure. In fact, one might say um, that their integration into existing systems. Um, because their integration into existing systems hasn't been designed into these objects, because they're presumed to somehow be these silver bullets that can just go into these sparse environments um, and substitute for the infrastructures that are already there, um, they actually contribute to the sparseness of this health system and the lack of integration between systems and technologies. Um, and in lieu of this integration, um, what they actually necessitated is the development of whole new kinds of global architectures for regulation, um, for the production of, production of um, job training aims, and so on. And this infrastructure, which is really being coordinated by the WHO, ironically actually focuses on the state which these RDTs are meant to bypass um, as, the, um, as their kind of object for um, the state as the space in which these new kinds of systems for integrating RDTs into the country to be created. Um, so I think I'll just stop there and then we'll pass it to you. Okay, so then we move on to quite a different example and uh, I suppose quite a different set of stories to accompany it. At the end of uh, 2010, the British Museum and the BBC unveiled the final artifact in their joint exhibition and radio documentary series, The History of the World in Hundred Objects. 
the hundredth object they announced with much fanfare was this solar-powered lamp and charger designed specifically for people living without access to mains electricity in Africa and Malaysia. The director of the British Museum, Neil McGregor, told the BBC that they wanted to choose an object that could only have been made in our times and it is changing lives around the world now. One object alone cannot definitively sum up the world today, he said, but the aspiration to make clean, affordable power available to the most remote communities through the natural power of the sun is extremely <coughs> worthy of this generation. Now, over the past decades, ultra-affordable solar-powered lighting technologies like this one have emerged as iconic objects at the vanguard of global social entrepreneurship and humanitarian design. These lights have become prominent in the portfolios of global social investment funds and international development organizations, and they've become prominent recipients of technical support, startup capital, and grants. This 100th object is also known as the Nova S200, one of three models that's designed and painted by a for-profit California-based company called Delight Design, which over the past five years has secured some $10 million in venture capital and claims to have sold some 50 million of these lights in India, uh, Tanzania, and Kenya. Later this year, a Danish non-profit organization will announce the uh, 2013 Index Award, a uh, half a million euro prize for technologies that are designed to improve life. This year, the contestants include at least 10 different solar-powered lighting technologies. In keeping with the parameters of the prize, each of these products makes claims about the potential impact of their design and the numbers of lives that they can improve, its social, environmental, and economic sustainability, as well as an argument about the unique fit of their design with what the uh, organizers of the award call the culture of the job. Now, of course, there's nothing new particularly about applications for solar photovoltaics in the global south. The first solar cells um, painted in 1954 at Bell Laboratories in the US was a technology in search of applications, and it became very quickly tied to an emerging discourse of international development, as it was articulated in the inaugural presidential address of uh, US President Harry Truman. We must embark, Truman had said, on a bold new program for making the benefits of our scientific advances and industrial progress available for the improvement and growth of underdeveloped areas. And in 1955, the first commercial license for the uh, for the manufacture of the silicon-based photovoltaic solar module was sold to a company that was exploring the commercial potential for cheap power in uh, Africa and Asia. Uh, places not just where power wasn't readily available, but also in places that were anticipated to bring handsome profits. Now, fast forward 50 years on, a new wave of commercial applications for solar photovoltaics has been uh, has accompanied quite dramatic falls in the cost of manufacturing solar modules that's been driven in part by uh, Taiwanese and Japanese microelectronic companies who've diversified into the global solar industry, but also by the emergence of new kinds of technologies like the thin film solar photovoltaic module and hyper-efficient white LEDs that make um, you know, solar power lighting systems much more energy efficient. But the, the emergence of the solar cell as a viable alternative or an appropriate technology that can provide decentralized energy services to individual households has proven to be enormously compatible with development policies that emphasize the role of the market in the delivery of energy services and with the reframing of poor people living at the bottom or the base of the economic pyramid as potential consumers rather than just the beneficiaries of, of aid. Today, international development policymakers make energy central to the achievement of improvements in health, energy, and livelihoods. And decentralized or micro-level infrastructures like um, low-cost uh, solar photovoltaic lighting systems that don't require the expansion of uh, grids for energy have come to be seen as uh, a decentralizing, democratizing pathway to development. Uh, power to the people, as uh, an article in Economist put it uh, a couple of years ago resonating quite nicely with the uh, Power to the People slogan in Donald Hensley's uh, talk today. It's just because the sort of like visit finds its way to different spaces. Um, 
Now, solo entrepreneurs like uh, the company that's built the uh, light that sits in the British Museum raise the profile of their products in Europe and America and raise finance for them by presenting lights as vehicles of revelation, emancipation, and enlightenment, and attach stories to these objects in which Europe users are delivered from the darkness of global poverty. But of course, what we actually find in concepts like uh, parts of rural North and uh, Central India, where I've been working, are very complex lightscapes uh, into which, uh, in, in which people live and into which these technologies appear. These are places where access to energy rarely corresponds to a simple binary defined by um, access to or lack of access to, to an electricity grid, but uh, uh, an energy ecosystem, if you like, in which people mix solid fuels, forestry products, biomass, as well as liquids, kerosene and diesel, to meet their lighting needs. And places where people have a high degree of exposure to renewable energy technologies as a result of past pilot projects or experiments. Take the village of uh, Gaudibuda in the highlands of uh, South Arisa. Um, places like this village uh, finds um, a whole range of different uh, technologies being used to light homes, from um, homemade uh, kerosene debbies, lanterns made from recycled uh, whiskey bottles, to these clay lamps put to um, um, burn food or, or, um, or vegetable oil. Um, until the mid-1980s, this village was, was almost entirely lit by kerosene um, or castor oil lamps. The first electricity lines were laid here in 1984, but today less than a quarter of the 80 households have a fixed connection to the grid, um, partly as a result of uh, a local or village level government authority being dominated by a community of high caste dairy farmers who um, monopolize access to the grid and refuse to allow the majority population of the village, a group of colleges speaking um, indigenous people, to, um, to have secure access to their community. So as a result, the, uh, the colleges speaking community uh, either live without electricity or in some clusters of the village uh, illegally draw current from uh, a single metered connection in the home of, um, of one uh, man who's the his sole public employee, a line manager at a local railway station. Now, to people um, in places like Gardegulda, solar technology frequently appears as a transition technology rather than a leapfrog technology. While the, the grid is associated with connectivity to public institutions, solar technologies are associated with decrepitude and disuse. Twenty years ago, um, solar power platform lights were installed in railway stations across the highlands of South Arisa as the procurement policies of India's public sector institutions kept the country's state-run solar manufacturers in business. Um, a solar power telephone system was even once installed at the centre of the village. And of ten villages within the greater Panchayat or parish, um, five of them have over the past 20 years had solar power streetlights installed. Now today, very little of those um, different pilot projects remains. Instead, you find the landscape littered with rusting frames, evidence to many local people of the, the, the solar as a, a future technology of the past rather than present. Now against this backdrop, you find uh, groups of um, young men employed as direct distributors for uh, solar lighting companies struggling to locate suitable villages in which to sell these solar power lighting systems. Um, part of the claims being made for these, these such affordable lights is that they um, can be sold rather than gifted to, to their end users. Um, and it's precisely that uh, ability of the lamp to generate both value for shareholders and value for the users, which is part of the claims that they made for them. Um, um, guys like these two 20-year-olds uh, kind of, um, who are employed as uh, direct distributors have uh, really struggled to, although they recognize the, the kind of preferences for the, their employer to try and search for, to, to sell lights in unelectrified villages, they really struggle to keep their monthly sales figures as high as possible. And invariably they find themselves driving around small, motorbike, uh, small market towns on the back of motorbikes and selling products to urban consumers 
like members of the security forces who were holed up in South Orissa in the war against India's Naxalite insurgents, or to high caste landowners and farmers, rather than the kind of, um, uh, the kind of people living below the poverty line who are anticipating the, 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 the perfect solution. Now, market research for the, 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 the 100th object in the British Museum was carried out by the um, American solar enterprise DI Design in this village of Budalos on the western edge of India's most popular state, Uttar Pradesh, in North India. And this village <coughs> lies on the edge of a, a wide plain that's dotted with uh, brick kilns and mobile telephone masts. But it also has one of the state also has one of India's poorest electricity infrastructures and some of the lowest rates of access to mains electricity. In July last year, the whole of North India, electrified in North India, was thrown into darkness by the country's worst ever blackout when four regional electricity grids failed. But nobody in Bangladesh even noticed. We read about it in the newspapers and the people in the village said, and I asked them about it a week later. Now, this village was a test site for Delight Design. The company gave some of its early prototypes to users here who participated back in uh, 2006 in a month long ethnographic study of users conducted by an Indian market research company. Invited participants in the study were paid to fill out forms detailing how they used the lights, when they used it, how they, um, and when they charged it, and they were photographed and videoed at home uh, using the lights or giving it, or using it with family members or placing it in the, in the sun to charge. Now, some of the outcomes of that um, market research have been reflected in um, new models of lamps and torches. Feedback from users here led D-Light Design to add some of their significant additions to early prototypes including a, a charging facility for mobile telephones and a fixed handle strap instead of a, a wrist strap. Based on feedback in villages like Badwas, they also streamlined the moulding, changed the colour of the designs, and eventually added an entirely new, um, new model to their product line, which is intended to uh, designed to build, to, to, to stand and look like an old kerosene lantern. The statements or, or that kind of market research also adds a different kind of value to companies like Delight Design. The statements from the villagers here were presented as evidence of the company's consultation with local stakeholders um, as part of the company's submission to the UN's Clean Development Mechanism. Um, some of the test users appear in the documentation um, um, offering evidence that the, the, the lights like this can substitute for um, uh, uh, carbon-based uh, lighting systems like this. Um, and also, most importantly, allowing the company to generate income from the sale of its products through their clean development mechanism. So, a couple of different examples, case studies, uh, which we could have used to spin out some of our original statements and claims in, in much more detail. But what we try to use some of our two examples to, 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 to argue, and come back to, see, to, to the original claims that we we're making, is that um, concepts, expectations, and values of what we call sparseness are being built into certain kinds of technologies, contributing to the growth of what we might call humanitarian capitalism and helping to shape new kinds of relationships between people, technologies, states, and entrepreneurs. Now, of course, by entreating us to imagine their opposites, conceptual terms like technological density and sparseness are risky. If we imagine that density maps onto social complexity, or the classic Euro-American spaces in science and technology studies, laboratories, financial markets, and clinics are more dense, then we risk impoverishing perhaps the material politics of this language. Instead, we think that some of the environments and examples in this paper push us to ask afresh, afresh what sparsity or density might be and whether we might want to oppose density or sparsity at all. For us, I think it also provokes other kinds of questions. How can we use these terms to provoke different kinds of pragmatic responses? How can we operationalize our analytical work? How can we make our um, 
vocabularies, conceptual vocabularies do uh, new work. How might we, for example, use some of this language to better visualize or communicate social material complexity or relationships to people and organizations who are trying to, working to improve access to health and energy.